All right, so good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from everyone. My name is Jesse and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you're joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And I wanna say a huge thank you again to all our teachers joining us live on YouTube and beyond. I know it's a really odd time to be a teacher, but we really appreciate you coming in as we continue to celebrate such amazing people and organizations across the globe. So January has been all about STEM careers. We have featured a wide array of really incredible people doing some really neat and unique stuff uh, across the globe and today is no different. We are joined live in London in the UK by Yasmin Ali and she is a chemical engineer which means she gets to work on some really really top-notch cool science and she's really fond of talking about that science. Her work has been featured in BBC, the Huffington Post and beyond. So today we're going to talk a little bit about what she gets to do for a role uh, and some of the ways that you guys might get to learn more and, and take action on some of the things she works on as well. So Yasmin, thank you so, so much for joining us today and take us away. <laughs> thank you. Hi yeah. everyone. Uh, as um, as um, Jesse just said, I'm Yasmin and I'm a chemical engineer. And I work in the energy sector. So I want to tell you about how I got there and tell you a bit about uh, where I came from. So I was actually born in Baghdad in Iraq in the Middle East. And when I was a kid, I remember we had power cuts all the time. So every now and then the electricity would go off, um, which was quite annoying, as you can imagine. Um, but when I was about 10 or 11 years old, we moved away from Iraq. And I moved to the UK with my family where I, I live now. So I now live and work in London. Um, and here the power, the energy systems are really good. So I don't remember ever having a power cut. So I completely forgot about all of that stuff until I started working in energy. And now part of my job is to make sure that people have the electricity that they need when they need it and to make sure that all of those systems are working and people don't have to experience power cuts. So it's really good to be able to uh, to do some good in the world and make sure that that's happening. And I got to the energy sector by becoming a chemical engineer. So I studied chemical engineering and chemical engineers do lots and lots of different things, not just energy. Um, chemical engineering is all about taking raw materials and then turning them into useful products. So a lot of the stuff that you will do every day that you will use will have had a chemical engineer involved at some point along the way. And um, one example of this is uh, materials. So you see some plastic bottles there. So that plastic would have been manufactured uh, in a factory somewhere and a chemical engineer would have uh, been involved in designing that process. But also inside those water bottles is clean drinking water that doesn't poison you when you drink it. And all around the world, there are these water purification facilities uh, that make sure people have clean drinking water. And that's another area that chemical engineers work in. We've also got uh, medicines, so or, or pharmaceuticals is um, the, the official name for this. So another area for chemical engineers to work in. And a really good example of this is the coronavirus vaccine that is being rolled out at the moment. So that vaccine uh, was uh, developed by scientists and doctors who worked really, really fast and hard to find the vaccine. But we now need to manufacture millions and millions of doses so that everybody gets a coronavirus vaccine. And this is where chemical engineers come in. So um, people with uh, that degree and that background can figure out how to take something that was created in a lab and produce it on a really massive scale so that we can get the, vir the, the vaccine out to everybody and get back to some kind of normal life. Um, another area is food and drinks. So I know quite a few engineers who work in food manufacture, including chocolate. So um, people work in, in chocolate factories and ice cream factories, and there's lots and lots of science and engineering involved in uh, any manufacture of food. Um, and then there's energy. So the kind of stuff that I do, and we use energy all of the time. And to demonstrate that, I, I took this photo. This was a couple of years ago now. I, I was sat in a cafe and I looked around and I thought, let me uh, think about where energy is being used in, in this quite 
you know, boring scene that I was sitting in. So there's some obvious stuff like my laptop and my phone and the lights. Um, they all were using electricity. There's also a lady on her phone, so she would have charged that at some point during the day. Behind me, there was a coffee machine uh, plugged in, making coffees for the people who are coming into this coffee shop. And then there was some stuff that was a bit less obvious. So um, the car and the bus um, had petrol in their tanks, and that was the energy source that's propelling them forward and you know taking all those people who are on the bus to where they need to get to. Then there was all the buildings. Um, so there was the glass in the windows and there's uh, asphalt and concrete on, on the road and on the sidewalk. Um, so all of those materials would have been manufactured and energy is needed to do that. Um, then there's my plastic water bottle, so pretty similar to what I was saying earlier. There's the, the plastic material, but also the clean water that's inside it. Um, and there's a guy walking past wearing a jacket that looked like it's made from some kind of synthetic fiber. So if you look at the label of what your clothes are made of, and um, sometimes they're made of polyester, so that's um, a synthetic fiber it's kind of like plastic and it's made in a factory and again you need an energy source to be able to um to to make it so um that's kind of where we use energy you can play this game as well just look around you and pick out the things that are using energy uh, so i started working um in in this sector and my first ever job was in a, a coal-fired power station. So this was a big factory and we uh, coal came in and that coal was burnt and the heat that was generated from burning that coal um, span uh, a turbine and that turbine generated electricity, which then went off in some cables to be used uh, by people in their home. Um, I also worked in gas-fired power stations. so. Uh, they are kind of the same, but they burn natural gas instead of coal to generate electricity again. And um, I wanted to know how we got these things out of the ground. So where does gas come from? Where does coal come from? And oil as well. And um, so I started working in oil and gas exploration and production, as it was called. So um, oil and gas are found deep underground. And sometimes they're under underground underneath the seabed and we uh, engineers come along and we put structures down like this uh, uh, platform that I'm sitting on, which is in the middle of the North Sea. And we have equipment on there that allows us to drill into the seabed and all the way down into rock formations where this oil and gas is trapped. And we also have equipment to be able to take that material and um, send it back to land, so through a pipeline, and there it can be used uh, to do something useful, like go to a power station to generate electricity, uh, and then that would come to your house and you'd use it for whatever you want to use it for. So coal and oil and gas are all fossil fuels. Uh, so these are great because they uh, are a really good source of energy and they've enabled us to get to where we are as a society. But they're also really terrible because we have emitted lots of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere through using these fossil fuels. So it's really, it's time for us to change that and start uh, building a more sustainable energy system. So emitting all of these greenhouse gases into the atmosphere is upsetting the balance of our planet and um, just changing the, the environment and causing climate change, um, which is having some really bad effects on the planet. So I left my uh, job in oil and gas and I decided that I wanted to be part of the solution and I wanted to uh, do something about climate change. So I now work for the UK government and I work on energy innovation. So I look for uh, technologies and solutions that are going to help us to reduce our emissions from our energy systems. So it's I really enjoy doing it. It's really fun and exciting. And I feel like I'm making a positive difference um, on the world. Uh, so as an engineer, I solve problems. But for any engineer to solve a problem, we first need to understand 
what what is the problem and how can we break it down and how can we understand what it is and, and focus on the, the bits that are going to make the biggest impact. So when it comes to climate change, we know that um, these greenhouse gases are um, contributing to the problem and we know roughly kind of where they come from, um, but we can measure and we can build up a better picture of that. So that's exactly what we do. We measure where greenhouse gas emissions are coming from and then climate scientists take all of that data and they produce some useful information um, like this. Uh, so this chart shows the uh, emissions by sector in the US in 2018. And I, I know some of you or maybe all of you are in Canada and it's a pretty similar picture um, across uh, a lot of countries. So it's similar in the UK as well, where um, more than half of the emissions come from transport uh, and the generation of electricity. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a bit more about each one of these. So transport is about a third of the emissions. And this is um, just from us getting into a car and traveling from our house to school or wherever it is that we want to get to. Um, so inside of that car, there is an engine and there's petrol in there. And when that petrol burns to move the car forward, uh, it's emitting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Not only that, so it's contributing to climate change, but it's also really bad for air quality. So um, it's emitting other stuff that's just not very nice for us to breathe in. So if we fix this problem, um, we are doing something about climate change, but also creating a cleaner uh, atmosphere for, for us to breathe and it'll be healthier for everybody. Electricity emissions, I've talked about a little bit already. So this is from these coal and gas fired power stations that um, burn fossil fuels to generate electricity. And then this um, these industrial emissions, um, these come from the stuff that we use. So everything that we use is manufactured in a factory and those factories need an energy source and they normally use fossil fuels. So as an example, if you think about a skyscraper, it's made from lots of uh, steel and cement and glass and these materials need huge amounts of heat and energy um, to be made in a factory. Uh, so if you think about steel, and once we've made it, we want to shape it into um, the, the bars and the rods that we use in the buildings. And just to melt it down, you need to heat it up to over a thousand degrees Celsius. So huge amounts of energy needed there. Um, and then there's emissions from residential. So that basically means the emissions from your house. And most of that comes from heating. So we all uh, heat our homes when it's cold outside. Uh, and normally use fossil fuels to do that. So that's another area where these greenhouse gas emissions are coming from. And um, finally, 10% uh, of the emissions come from agriculture. So um, this is mostly from uh, ruminant animals. So these are sheep and cows. And basically what happens is these animals burp and they fart and they are emitting methane when they do that. And methane is a really, really potent greenhouse gas. So it's like carbon dioxide in that it contributes to climate change, but it's kind of stronger. So a smaller amount of methane uh, has a larger greenhouse gas effect. So if we had less of these animals around, then we would be able to do something about that. So now you can see where these emissions are coming from and we can start to think about the types of technologies and the solutions that are out there to um, fix these problems. Um, so for transport, you probably have seen electric cars around. So these, uh, instead of having a petrol engine, they have a battery and you charge them up with electricity. Um, so these are great uh, because they are not emitting any of that nasty stuff that makes our air not very nice to breathe. Um, and uh, they are lower emissions as well. But we have to be careful here because we need to think about where the electricity is coming from. And um, if you've got a big coal-fired power station down the road uh, that's generating the electricity to charge your electric car, then you're not really fixing the problem. You're just um, emitting uh, the greenhouse gases somewhere else. 
And that's where uh, things like this come in. So this is a, an offshore wind turbine and these things uh, capture the motion from the wind uh, and they spin and as they spin, they generate electricity and they're becoming more and more popular. You might have seen some of them around. Uh, some are on land. These ones are out at sea and um, they are absolutely massive. Um, and just to show you how huge they are, uh, this the arrow there, uh, you can see some dots on the blade. Those are two people doing work on that blade. Uh, so that's just one blade. The, the whole thing is is, is huge. So they're, they're quite exciting projects, um, quite exciting uh, turbines to, to see and uh, to work on as well. Um, so these ones are attached to the seabed, um, which means that uh, we're quite limited to where we can put them because the water has to be quite shallow. But a new thing that people are working on are these floating offshore wind turbines. So these are um, floating. They're not, uh, they're not kind of attached to the seabed, um, which means that you can go further out at sea and further out at sea, the wind is uh, stronger and more consistent. Um, so it opens up a lot more of the sea for us to be able to use for this uh, renewable energy. So this doesn't emit carbon dioxide um, when it generates electricity. Um, and then there's the sun. We should be using the energy from the sun. Um, and these are, we can do that by using uh, solar panels. And I, I really like this. Um, this is uh, designed by an architect, I think. This is a stained glass window that has solar panels integrated into it. So um, not only does it look nice, but it's doing something really useful. And you, if you look at the, the bottom of the photo, you might be able to make out there's um, a USB charger there. So you could be charging your phone from your window, which is quite cool. Um, I've talked a bit about heat. Um, so this technology uh, is all about heat. So the reason that we have to heat our homes is because the heat that we put into them is constantly leaking out. So if you imagine that your house is like a, a box and you're heating it up from the inside, but that heat is um, is being lost through the through the walls and the floors and the ceilings. And um, so a really good thing to do is to insulate your house. And in the UK, we have these houses that are quite old that have a, a gap between the floorboards and the floor. And it's hard to get in there to insulate. So um, this company designed this robot that can fit into that gap and spray insulation onto the bottom of the floorboards. Uh, and make that um, house more insulated. So it's a little bit like putting a, a jacket or a blanket around your house to stop it from losing the heat um, that you're putting into it. Um, and once we have uh, reduced our emissions as much as possible, uh, it's uh, also an option to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Now, really important point here, uh, trees are amazing at doing this. So trees suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere through the photosynthesis process. So we should be planting trees and preserving all of our green spaces and just making sure that we're protecting our forests. That is very, very important. Um, but if we do get really desperate, um, we might be able to uh, mechanically suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, which is what this machine here is doing. So it's drawing air in through those giant fans and then that air is being um, separated and the carbon dioxide uh, is removed from it and it can be uh, stored underground or um, just out, out of the atmosphere. Um, and I, I think this is a very much a last resort. It's not something we should be relying on, but it is a, an option that we have. Um, so that's some of the kind of stuff that I get involved with as a, as a chemical engineer in energy. Um, that's all from me for today, but I would love to answer any questions that you have for me. Yasmin, that was fantastic. What an informative and nuanced talk. That was great. If you want to leave your screen share so you can see us and have a bit of a conversation, that would be awesome. Yeah. And we're in. We've got 250 kids from across the continent uh, joining in for this. So welcome yeah. into all of you guys. Um, we're going to start with our live groups and I'll be taking some questions from YouTube as well. So Miss Lemire's class, if you guys want to kick us off with a question joining in Ontario, come on in and go for it.
Okay, so we're wondering, we have two questions. Um, the solar panels in the window, is that something that would be affordable for most households? And the other question the kids keep asking me is, how does energy live in plastic? Nice. Yasmin, did you catch those or not? I did not. I, I think my laptop. Oh, okay. That's okay. So the, first yeah, that's from the, the first question from their class was, is the, the solar panel window something that would be affordable for anyone from home? Like could a, a normal house put this in or is it sort of a test concept? And the second was, uh, and I've been seeing this on YouTube too, how does energy live in plastic? If you could explain how that works, that would be great. Okay, I think I caught the second question. How does energy live in plastic? Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so you have to kind of go back to when it was, how it was made. So um, it doesn't just appear out of nowhere. Um, plastic is made from uh, petrochemicals, so essentially from oil. Uh, so when I described that you would uh, drill to get to the oil reserves that are deep underground. So during that drilling process, you are putting energy in um, and then you get that oil out, you take it to a refinery, uh, you uh, separate all of the different kind of uh, uh, different types of oil that are in there. And then you take the bit that you need and you want to make plastic from that. So that goes to another factory um, to be turned into plastic and all of those processes uh, need an energy supply. Um, so right. everything everything that you own has kind of energy in it really because it's gone through that kind of process. I, I hope that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love when we get a chance to cover that question. So that was great. Um, the, the first one, just to repeat it, the, the solar panel window, is that something that anyone could have in their home or is that more of a you know cutting edge tech that's coming down the road? <laughs> Um, I came across it online somewhere, um, but I think I'm not, I don't think it's that cutting edge. It should be around. So lots of people have solar panels. Um, I don't know how popular or kind of, uh, they might be quite expensive. I guess that would be the, the limiting factor there for the solar powered windows, but, um, you could look it up. Um, yeah. so if you just Google, uh, solar panel windows, see what comes up. Some of the technologies coming uh, down the pipeline are incredibly cool. So I would encourage all our classes to check up some solar innovations uh, when they're done this broadcast. All right, let's go to Ms. Jillison's class, grade 12s joining in. Uh, if you guys have a question for us, come on in. If you don't, I know you're grade 12, so sometimes grade 12s are a little shy, but if you have a question, just demute your mic and you're good to go. I was wondering about like the energy that goes into creating wind turbines and how much energy goes into creating that versus the amount of energy that they produce. Yeah. That's an excellent question. Um, so yeah, I, you've picked up that uh, you obviously need uh, energy input into uh, actually manufacturing the wind turbines. Um, I don't know the, the full answer, but I do know about the, um, the carbon dioxide emissions that come from them. So I think we, we measure that by grams of carbon dioxide per kilowatt hour of energy produced and I think for wind it's around 12 grams uh, whereas if you compare that to a uh, gas fired power station it would be about 500 so it just wow. gives you a bit of perspective uh, on the on the emissions reduction that you can get from using uh, wind turbines and that that would take into account the uh, emissions from the manufacturer. Interesting. That's a question we've never gotten before. So thank you so much to Ms. Jillison, student. Um, all right, I'm going to go to Ms. Treyer's class. If you guys have one for us, come on up, and then I'll take a few from YouTube. So just demute that microphone, and you are good to go. Hi. I have a student with a question. Perfect. Can I ask you a question? He's going to ask himself. Is it possible to turn greenhouse gases into oxygen all over again? Okay, very cool. So if you didn't That's catch that, yeah. Oh, did you catch the question? Yeah, yeah, yeah I did. Yep. Um, let me think. So greenhouse gas, uh, it depends which one it is. So if it's carbon dioxide, then you could, in theory, separate the carbon from the oxygen and you would get oxygen out of the other end. And that's actually um, 
something that is being looked at, but more for the carbon side of the carbon dioxide. So that last picture that I showed um, of the carbon dioxide removal fans, what you could do is um, take that carbon dioxide, separate the carbon from the oxygen. So you would uh, either use the oxygen, maybe in uh, hospitals, they sometimes need to use it, or you'd release it into the atmosphere. And then the carbon you could combine with uh, hydrogen and you would get a synthetic oil. So we could produce uh, oil that is made from the carbon dioxide that's being captured. Um, but that whole process needs quite a lot of energy. So we have to think about where that comes from. You touched upon something at the end of your talk that I love, which is the idea that nature is a much better solution. It's not to say that these aren't incredible technologies that people have, but there's such a bias towards these, you know, moonshot space agey things that are really exciting, but you could do the exact same thing by planting a forest or ensuring that a wetland survives. And so I really like that we got that message in. Um, all right, I'm gonna go to a few questions on YouTube and then I'll come back with Ms. Stangolis' class in a minute. So Libby, uh, joining us in Auburn, Alabama, she wants to know what's the most interesting project you've ever worked on, Yasmin? Ooh, that's... Um, no pressure. <laughs> <difficult. Yeah. laughs> um, I'm working at the moment on hydrogen, so um, uh, hydrogen innovation. So in when you burn natural gas, you release carbon dioxide as part of that chemical process, but you can burn hydrogen and you don't release carbon dioxide in that process. You get the hydrogen combines with uh, oxygen and you just get water, water vapor at the end. So this is quite a growing area in the energy sector where we're thinking about, could we replace natural gas with hydrogen? <laughs> but then again, you look one step back and, you, and it's like, okay, where are we gonna get the hydrogen from? Um, so there are lots of different methods of doing that. Um, one is electrolysis, so you can pass an electric current through water uh, and split that water into hydrogen and oxygen. Um, but if you, if you did that using renewable energy, so if you had a wind turbine powering that process, then you could produce green hydrogen and we could use that for heating, for example. Um, so that's quite interesting. Um, that's what I'm working on at the moment. Very cool. Well, you mentioned windmills, and this is our other question from YouTube. So Safina wants to know everything about how these things stay afloat in the ocean. How don't they fall over? Aren't they very heavy? Uh, you showed these these massive turbines. So how are we keeping that uh, upright in the ocean? Um, yeah, so the ones, the first ones that I showed a picture of, um, they are actually attached to the seabed. So um, I'm trying to think how to describe it. It's a bit like if you got I don't know, a big stick and you just jammed it into the ground um, and into the seabed. So that's how they stay up. They're kind of attached in there um, in the same way that, um, I don't know, a telephone pole is, yeah. it doesn't fall over. Um, the ones that float, um, they're not uh, kind of stabbed in as, <laughs> as I described it, um, but they are anchored down. So there will be um, giant chains that um, attach them to the seabed. Uh, so they'll stay roughly in the same position, but they will move around. And that, that is a challenge, um, but they'll, they'll have some pretty fancy technology on them. Um, I don't know, maybe things like dynamic positioning systems. I'm just guessing now that keep them um, in, the same, in the same place. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know exactly how they stay in the same place. No, but that's a really good analogy. I love the telephone pole thing. And again, for class, when you're done this, look up some of these turbines compared to some of the size of the most iconic buildings in the world. They dwarf the Statue of Liberty. They're getting close to Eiffel Tower size, some of the big concept ones. There's some really, really amazing stuff out there. All right, let's go to Ms. Stangolis' class joining us in Toronto. You guys have a question? Come on in. Hi there. Many of my students uh, would like to know what sparked your interest in chemical engineering and what did you do um, to pursue your career what are the, some of the things that you love most about what you do and what are some of the challenges that you face? Nice. Yeah, um, so I kind of found out about it by accident. Um, I thought about doing medicine and being a doctor. Um, I liked science and maths and I liked everything. I like art as well and languages. So I kind of struggled to decide what I wanted to do. Um, but I actually got an, a leaflet about chemical engineering and I thought it seemed 
kind of cool. So I just went for it, not really knowing what it was going to be. Um, but that's why I like to do these kind of talks and let people know that chemical engineering exists and it's an option. Um, and then to choose um, my career, I did some work experience placements while I was studying. Uh, so I did one in a power station and I just, I really liked being on site. Um, I liked being in the power station and seeing how everything worked. And I also liked the fact that it was something that everybody needs and everybody uses. And I would be doing something that's like super useful to everyone. Um, so that's how I chose that. Um, and then I, I've forgotten the other half of the question. I'm sorry. <laughs> what are some of the challenges that you face in your day-to-day -day work or at, um, while becoming uh, an engineer at this point in your career? Yeah, sure. Um, so the, the studying is quite difficult. I'm not going to lie, but it's worth it. Um, and then I, I actually, I love the work um, and the challenges that we're working on like big challenging projects so that can be quite daunting but i'm also surrounded by other engineers and other scientists and everybody's really helpful and like pretty enthusiastic about their job so um yeah it's like it is challenging but it's good because you can lean on other people to help you out Great answers. All right. Um, we're going to go to Mr. Blake's class joining us in Brampton. I do want to do a shout out to our New Jersey and our Texas classes that have joined us on YouTube. So welcome in, guys. Again, we've got tons of kids from across the continent. Uh, but Mr. Blake, come on in and go for it. Hi. Uh, yeah, uh, I think you've, you've answered one of the questions about what is it like to be an engineer. So thank you. Um, another question was about the floating turbines and getting that electricity back to land. Is it stored in batteries or are there like cables running under the water? Yeah, that is an excellent question. Um, and it's actually one of the, the problems with these because it's quite challenging to um, a, put a cable in place that's going to survive um, being bashed around by all the waves. Um, so I, I actually met someone who was studying, doing a PhD, so studying specifically that problem of how do you reinforce these cables um, to take electricity back. Um, so yeah, you would you would um, use cables normally. I, you wouldn't uh, put batteries out there. Um, but one of the other options, which is something that I have come across that I'm also working on, is uh, instead of exporting electricity back to land, you could put electrolyzers on the wind turbine itself and use the electricity to produce hydrogen and then put that hydrogen into a pipeline and take that back to land because we're quite good at putting stuff into pipelines from the middle of the sea and taking that back to land. So that that is one option of how we could do that. Yeah. Uh, very cool. That's uh, super neat. We don't typically touch upon such a sort of high end topics in this. So it's really nice to have a, a different perspective today. All right. Uh, Miss Parrish's class joining us at Petrolia. If you want to come on in, just demute that mic and you're good to go. Miss Parrish. Hello. So one of my students, Alex, he is wondering what, uh, maybe through your experiments, maybe through your education, what is one of the strangest or weirdest or things that you have found to conduct um, energy or electricity? Oh, um... <laughs> that is a tough one. <laughs> yeah, it is. I'm trying to think what weird thing that conducts electricity. Um, I'm going to go with, it's not electricity, um, but so, something that I came across or something that I think is interesting is how you can use um, gases to uh, transfer energy. And I'm thinking specifically here of liquid nitrogen. Um, so if you, if you liquefy nitrogen, um, you have to cool it down to minus 196 degrees Celsius and it becomes a liquid. And then you can use that to, um, to freeze things essentially. So it's a form of energy transfer. So you, you might have seen people making ice cream using liquid nitrogen. And so what you're doing there is uh, that, that nitrogen that's been 
uh, liquefied is taking the energy away from your ice cream mixture and causing it to freeze and then the liquid nitrogen is um, being really uh, is going back to being a gas so that's a kind of interesting uh, getting into thermodynamics and how uh, energy and heat uh, interrelate to each other. I like that in one week we can go from talking about uh, having baby sloths eating flowers in our programs to thermodynamics and liquid nitrogen. I love it. Um, I'm going to take one quick question from YouTube and then I'm going to go back to our live classes for another round. Uh, so Ms. Wu's class joining us in Houston, they want to know what advice would you give to a middle school student that wants to become you? So if someone wanted to become you, Yasmin, what would they do? What sort of education do they need? Any sort of obstacles you'd highlight for them? And just for me, uh, middle school is what age? I, uh, 10 through 13. Okay, um, I would say uh, stick with science and maths. That's very important. Um, and be curious about how the world around you works. Um, so that, that's kind of the, the main thing. Um, and you could start looking into uh, what types of chemical engineering degrees there are if you want to go and study at university. Um, start talking to chemical engineers, uh, see what kind of jobs they do. Uh, you could, when you're a little bit, when you're in, in high school, maybe start looking for work experience to see if you can try it out, see if you like it. Um, but yeah, the main thing is to um, stick with science and math. And it's something that we need those subjects to understand how the world works. So they're really important. Fantastic. Thanks, Ms. Wu, for the question. All right, let's dive back in with our live groups. Ms. Lemire's class, if you want to come in, go for it. Hi, yes. We're wondering if you had to resort to the mechanical ways of sucking the carbon dioxide from the air and storing it underground, what are the possible environmental impacts or dangers of this process? Um, I'm not an expert on this, but it's um, it's called carbon capture and storage. Um, so it's been studied quite extensively. Um, so what they do is they take the, the carbon dioxide that's been captured and then put it into uh, old oil or gas fields, um, which would naturally have um, a kind of cap over the top so that you wouldn't have the carbon dioxide leaking out. Um, so that's the, the concept of it. There are some uh, sites around the world that uh, do this. It's not really been done to a, a large scale yet. Um, so I guess one of the risks is you could have the carbon dioxide leaking out, um, but I would hope that uh, we, we do enough pre-planning to make sure that doesn't happen. Great question, guys. All right, let's go back to our grade 12s. Our, it's so rare to have grade 12s, it's so nice. So Ms. Jillison's class, if you guys want another question, come on in and uh, demute that mic and you're good to go. In fact, every all our teachers can demute your mic. We can only hear you when I bring you in. You're good to go, Ms. Jillison, go for it. Um, what other engineers do you work with in your job or what other kind of scientific roles do you see in your day-to-day -day work? Nice. Uh, yeah, so at the moment, um, I work for um, a government department. Um, there are mechanical engineers who work with me and there are chemists. Um, I work quite closely with the climate science team. So there's lots of um, climate scientists. Uh, so they do things like um, measuring where the greenhouse gases are coming from in the UK and um, putting all of that data together and coming up with um, systems for um, measurement and how we kind of compare ourselves to other countries. Um, there are uh, people with physics backgrounds, um, but it's not just scientists and engineers who I work with. There are also um, people who are specialists in finance and contracts and communications. So um, I have colleagues who help us with um, putting press releases out when something good has happened and we want to get a story out to the public. Um, so I work with all sorts of different people. And, yeah. and I think actually being a, a good engineer, you need to be able to work with other people because we are working on these massive problems, massive projects. And as an individual, I can't make much difference. Uh, but I, if I can work with other people well, then we have a better chance of um, succeeding. Yeah. 
I love that message and highlighting how many different roles are involved in things like this. We get this in our space presentations, deep sea diving, pretty much every topic we have. If you're interested in this as a, as a career, you don't necessarily need to be a top scientist. You don't need to necessarily be a chemical engineer like Yasmin, although that's a super cool job. There are lots of ways into some really interesting roles in the world. So just a, a note for all our students today, and I'm, I'm glad we got a chance to touch upon that. All right, let's go to Ms. Traer's class. We got four, time for four more questions from our live groups. Ms. Traer, come on in, go for it. We have no more questions. We're just enjoying listening to all the questions that have already been asked for us. Awesome. Well, I hope you continue enjoying and uh, stay tuned for the, our last three here. Ms. Dangolas, if you have one for us, come on in. I do. My student, Neve, would like to know, is it possible to convert all plastics directly into useful forms of energy and chemicals? And how would this be done? Wow. Uh, yes. Um, so you can just burn plastics and generate electricity that way. So you could, um, like I, I, I described how we can burn um, coal and um, oil and gas, you can do the same with plastics. And there are um, these uh, waste energy facilities um, in some parts of the world. We have a couple of them here in the UK where they take the rubbish that is produced by, by people and they burn it and it generates electricity. Um, I wouldn't recommend it because it's quite bad for air quality. So lots of um, other stuff comes off the plastics when you burn them. Um, another thing that I've seen, another kind of technology is um, they take the plastic and they heat it up at a really high temperature and it breaks it down back into what it used to be. Yeah. And then you can use that to, to manufacture new stuff. So not quite turning it into energy but recycling it into other things very cool question guys and i'll note for miss stangles's class we actually in toronto in the east end used to have uh, plants that did draw energy from waste products so we bury things and get to capture the gas from that to help do some stuff so uh some neat stuff to look into as a nice follow-up too All yeah, right. that's, um, that's a different kind of um yeah. it's like landfill gas so um, yeah. the, the kind of organic waste that we produce, you can get energy out of that as well, but that's a, a whole other topic. Yes. <laughs> um, all right, Mr. Blake's class, come on in, demute that mic and you're good to go. So I'm to add on, we still do that here in Brampton, Ontario. We still have an incinerator that makes uh, electricity to power homes. <laughs> but um, one of my questions wants to know, like um, just something else that's really interesting or exciting about conducting electricity she was listening to like the hydrogen and maybe we're not like fully understanding like how hydrogen gas can be used to like um, store and then be later used to release electricity. Yeah. Like, um, as... Yeah, sure. So um, let's say you uh, have a wind turbine and you uh, take the electricity from that and you feed that into uh, an electrolysis machine so that would have some water in it and you're splitting, you split that water into oxygen and hydrogen. You then say you store your hydrogen in a tank for, for argument's sake. Uh, and then later on you need uh, to generate electricity again. So you would take that hydrogen and essentially just burn it through a turbine. So you would burn it um, and use that heat to drive a turbine to generate electricity. So it's a, it would be a very similar process to what you would do with natural gas or coal. Um, the, another option is to use fuel cells. And so you could put that hydrogen into fuel cells, which I believe is more efficient, um, but it's not something, yeah, I, I don't know all of the numbers off the top of my head, um, but that's what you would do. Or you could, Rather than using the hydrogen to generate electricity, you could use it to generate heat. Um, so in the UK, in our houses, we have these gas boilers. Uh, so we all have a pipe coming into our home with uh, natural gas feeding into this like tiny little gas boiler that generates the heat and the hot water that we need. Um, instead of natural gas, we could put hydrogen into those. So burn hydrogen instead of, instead of gas. Does that answer the question? Think so, Mr. Blake. Yes. Let's see. What would the what would the output be? What would the output be? Would it be water? What what would what would come out of that? Yeah. Ah, oh, what would the so the the chemical reaction itself? If you're burning hydrogen, it's it's hydrogen plus oxygen, and you get H two O, so you get water at the other end. 
Cool. Awesome, guys. All right, uh, Ms. Parrish, we're coming to you in two seconds, but we've had a few teachers type in this question. So in lieu of Ms. Treyer's class, what's the most dangerous part of your job, Yasmin? So many people want to know. Are you like fighting off death at every turn or what's going on? <laughs> um, not so dangerous anymore. Um, I said anymore like I <laughs> like it used to be. Um, I guess uh, when I worked in oil and gas um, and I would go every now and then would go offshore to visit uh, an oil or gas platform that was in the middle of the sea. Um, so to get there, I would go on a helicopter. And that was a whole kind of thing where I had to put on a this dry suit before getting into the helicopter. And before I was allowed to do that, I had to do some offshore survival training in case the helicopter crashed. Uh, so we practiced in this giant fake helicopter that was suspended from a crane and you you would get into it and then they would kind of drop it into a swimming pool and flip it upside down and teach you how to get out so it's not as scary as it sounds um it was okay but that's uh it, and tough. also like that it, it's very very unlikely that a helicopter is gonna crash into the sea um, but I suppose you could say that could have been dangerous. I, I would say so. Well, I'm glad you had the training just in case. That is very, very cool. In fact, the only time we've ever heard about that in any other program is astronaut training. So that's very cool. Um, way to go. Uh, all right, Ms. Parrish, we're already past time. We're just too enthusiastic uh, today about chemical engineering, which is awesome. Ms. Parrish, if you want to wrap us up with one more question, go for it. Sure. So um, a question that I was wondering about, you mentioned your childhood um, growing up with the power outages happening um, kind of set you on this course for your education and career. So with this sort of technology being rather expensive, setting up turbines or solar panels, do you ever see the possibility of this greener technology um, helping maybe less serviced or less um, developed areas to bring power to, to their communities? Yeah, for sure. So it's actually not that expensive. Um, uh, wind power and solar power is actually cheaper than coal at the moment. So it's um, it's developed so much over the last um, 10 to 20 years that it is, it's not even expensive anymore. And if you think about it, your fuel is free. So once you put this thing, the infrastructure in place, you don't have to be constantly paying for coal or gas. Um, so yeah, it's definitely uh, the the fuel of the or the energy of the future, and it is uh, being used in less developed countries. And um, so there's lots of rollout of solar, especially in hot countries, um, and wind. So yeah, it's um, a, a massive opportunity. Very, very cool. What a great question to wrap up on. Uh, I'd encourage our classes too to check out some of the solar installations in Morocco, especially, which are just incredible on the world scale. Um, and if you want to learn more about Yasmin, she shared this at the end of her talk, but you can find more about her at engineeryasmin.com or on Twitter at, at engineeryasmin. I'd encourage you to do so. Uh, and Yasmin, what we do at the end of every talk, I, I know most of our teachers are, are just sitting at home right now, but I will bring them in, say a quick thank you and goodbye for joining us today. It was such a pleasure hearing your story and such a, a really cool presentation. So thank you so much and all our teachers are now in if you guys want to join me in saying a quick